Hey everyone, and welcome back to Suited Aces Poker, where every week we watch hundreds of poker hands from poker vloggers all over YouTube to bring you 10 of the best. And it was a very exciting week for us this week as we hit 100 subscribers. We couldn't be doing it without you, so to everybody that subscribed, thank you so much. If you haven't yet, be sure to like this video and then click the subscribe button. It certainly helps out the channel a whole bunch. In this week's episode, we've got some big bets, some big balls, and a bounty tournament that goes oh so well for one of our poker vloggers. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Ten of the best. At number 10 this week, and close to broke, is playing in a 5-10 game at the Commerce in California. And getting bet into in spots like this is what makes us all love the game so much. Under the gun decides to raise a $30, seems like a pretty solid pro. Middle position decides to make the call, who just sat down. And we look down at pocket sevens here on the button. I'm going to go ahead and make the call. We're going three ways off to a flop that comes absolutely perfect. King seven five. Man, this is what dreams are made of. There is a flush route there that does have a little bit of spice that's needed on this flop, as for the most part, it's kind of dry. Sure, there's some straight draws and, I guess, flush draws that exist, but for the most part, not really worried about all that that much. The initial raiser decides to see bet for 30 bucks. The middle position player decides to raise to 100 bucks. I was going to min click it for $200, but then I thought, hey, that's going to be way too strong. I've got to allow these opponents to get more money in the middle. If a heart comes, we can deal with it then, but at the moment, I'm just not worried about a whole lot. We have middle set here. I end up just making the call, which, again, still looks strong anyways. The initial raiser pretty quickly gets out of the way. We're going off to a turn card that comes a jack of clubs. At this point, my opponent seems to be loving his hand enough to go all in here for $400. A really big bet here that I'm never folding to. I snap call his bet. I immediately let him know that I have a set here. He flashes a jack. We're going off to a river card that comes a nine of spades. My opponent turns over King Jack offsuit, and we're going to end up taking a massive pot down against a really, really cooler situation for my opponent. At nine this week, and Frankie from the Next Gen Boys is playing in a 2 5 10 game at the Texas Card House in Dallas. And even with the rivered flush, do you think you'd be raising for value on the river? We've got aces in the small blind, playing 2 5 10. Button raises it up to $40. We're three betting. I make it 180 to go. Folds back to the button, who says this. Please call me. I hate when people say that. That common is going to play a huge role in how we play this hand as we see a beautiful ace in the window of a 10-7 ace flop. We have the nuts again. I normally down bet here, but because of that comment, I decide to slow play this hand. I would have checked here with jacks through kings and I'm hoping to make him think I have one of those hands. The button doesn't bite though, he checks it back and the turn comes the eight of hearts. Again though, I check it over to Jeff on the button who told me one minute earlier he had a bad hand. Now he bets $200. Let's go. We make the call. The river comes the four of hearts, and I check my set of aces for the third time in a row. If he bets and we win, we're going to have the biggest win of our lives. If he checks, we'll come up just short. And then Jeff grabs a pink chip from his stack and makes it $650 to go. He has 2,000 more in his stack, but I'm not gonna get greedy when there's a flush out there. I don't see the point in raising unless he's somehow at a worse set. I make the call. He flips over pocket threes. We show our aces right away. What a way to finish the session. Number eight this week, and Wolfgang is also in Dallas. He's at the poker house. He's playing in a one, two, five cash game. And as you'll see, it's a scary board. But Wolfgang asks an interesting question. Just exactly what do you do with kings on this flop? Answers in the comments below, please. I'm in the plus two position. I have 2.5k in my stack. And I look down at the Cowboys in Texas pocket kings. Victor opens it up to $20 with queen 10 of hearts. I three bet him to $55. Nothing too out of line just yet. Eric puts in the call. So does Todd. And uh, Victor does as well. We're going four ways to the flop here with pocket kings. We're feeling pretty great about our hand, especially on a board like 10, 6, 9 rainbow. If you look at everybody's hands, it's pretty funny. They actually all flop 
top pair. Todd also has top pair with a gutter to the straight, so a lot of things going on here on this board, and he decides to lead out for $175. Victor also flopped top pair here, so he's not going to fold for $175 bucks in the actions on me. Quick little poll, you guys. Let me know down in the comments. When we re-raise pre-flop here with pocket kings, and then we get led into for $175, and we see under the gun put in the call, what do you guys do here from the plus two position with pocket kings? Do you A, flat call the 175? Do you B, re-raise to something like four or 500? Or do you see just get away from your hand here at Pocket Kings and just muck them? Interested to see what you guys think. In the moment, I think about all three options, although I'm never really going to fold here. I decide that the best play is just a flat call here. It's possible somebody has a set like sixes or nines. Someone also could have a hand like seven, eight. So I decide to put in the 175 and we'll see what happens on the turn. Eric has top pair as well here, but he wisely gets out of the way. We're now going to see this turn card three-handed, which comes the king of hearts. Bang! We turn turn the set. Great card for us because now we're only losing to 7-8 and we could boat up on the river winning this pot in a suck out. We'd now beat 6s, 9s, and 10s and us not raising on the flop is going to disguise our hand pretty well here. And Todd does not slow down in the slightest. He bets out for $350. No fear in that guy whatsoever. Actions on Victor and it's only $350 for him to call. The King of Hearts actually improves him to a gutter as well. Any jack would give him the straight so I don't blame him for putting in the call here. He actually thinks about it for a while which is surprising but then ultimately finds a call actions back over to me. 1.5k in the middle and it's 350 for me to call. Obviously, I'm going to be at least calling. Could be going for a raise here targeting any of the sets, two pairs or the pair plus straight draws. But in the moment, I actually decide just to flat call here for $350. Reason being, there's a lot of money in the pot and both other players seem to have something on this board. If they check to me on the river, I can go for a bet and probably get paid here. So when I check behind, the eight of diamonds peels off on the river, which isn't a great card because it puts a four liner to the straight. Todd bets out for $750 now, which is music to our ears. Victor gets out of the way and folds actions on me. Obviously, with my top set, I'm never going to be folding, but can I go for a raise on this board? I don't really think so. We would only be getting value from sets, but Todd has shown a propensity to make good folds in tough spots, so I don't really think he'd call me with a set or a two pair here, so we're only going to get called by better, so I just snap him off here for $750. Expect me to be good a large portion of the time. He turns over his two pair, and we're going to take down that $3,000 pot with our top set, $1,600 worth of profit from that hand alone coming my way number seven this week and rampage poker your boy ethan is playing in a 400 dollars world series of poker circuit bounty tournament at the casino royale in saint martin and will ethan get the river he needs to collect another bounty actually this two-parter from ethan is definitely worth a watch Click on the link in the description box to see his video in full and all of the others that we feature in this week's video. Next interesting spot, I pick up Queen 5 of Hearts in the cutoff and action folds to me. I'm short sacked here, but I still think this is a good hand to raise and play being in position. So I raise it up to 32,000, just a min raise. Short sack in the big blind decides on making the call. Pretty solid player and could be defending wide. We're off to a flop, which is magical. Three, four, six, two hearts. Have the heart draw, have the open-ended straight draw, just absolute gin, and maybe even better news, he just open rips. Goes all in for maybe the size of the pot, and I couldn't call any faster, and we see amazing news. He has jack five of clubs. So basically, I'm free rolling this hand so hard, and when the turn comes a queen, that's it. I basically win the river seven of hearts, so he does get there with the straight, but I also improve to the flush, and I knock out this player. It's the eighth bounty of the tournament, and winning a massive hand like this is a great way to continue steamrolling through this tournament. At six this week, and Brad Owen is playing in the club. He part owns with Doug Polk and Andrew Nimi. That's right, he's playing at the Lodge in Austin, Texas. He's in a massive $25.50, $100 cash game. And when the money card is in the window and your opponent calls all the way to the river, these are the kind of hands we live for. Doug has pocket jiggities and a second act pre-flop. He raises to 250. We've got something that we'd like to play. 
We're in kind of early middle position with pocket sixes. This is a spot where the vast majority of players are going to flat the initial preflop raise with the small to medium pocket pair under these conditions. That's totally fine, but I've been doing some studying with Nick Petrangelo for part of the cash game course that's still going to be coming out on upswing. It's just been pushed back a few months and is scheduled to be released in the fall now. Anyway, here's a look at the preflop chart Petrangelo gave me for this exact situation. You'll notice that you're supposed to play a tight range since there are still several players left to act behind. It's mostly a 3 better fold strategy. Even with sixes, folding well over 50% of the time is the correct play, mixed in with some calls and some three bets, that you see represented with the green. When I'm on stream, I try to take the more aggressive line as often as possible. The camera barely picks it up in the left of the screen, but I three bet to 700. It's not necessarily something that Doug or anyone else at the table would expect, and these guys are sharp guys. I need to do things that will occasionally catch people off guard in order to be successful at these stakes. Wow, Brad getting after it here, three bets to 700. Hey, my one thing from the fridge, soda. Tell me. Owner on owner crime here. Partial owners of the club, Doug Polk, Brad Owen. That's okay. Doug makes the call, which he's supposed to do around 80% of the time because often I'll have at least two overs, if not an over pair. My three bet with sixes is just a low frequency play. Sometimes when you take a risk, you get punished, and sometimes you get rewarded. The flop comes 10-6 deuce rainbow, we've got a completely hidden middle set, and what's even better is that Doug has an overpair to the board. Doug checks, we've got the second best hand possible in what's becoming a large pot. I want to make sure that we're able to keep the opponent in with a wide variety of holdings and possibly induce a check raise. We down bet to 500 to make it very enticing to at least stick around with a call. This board won't always be great for my range, pretty regularly I'll just have an ace high type of hand that Doug may want to protect against. Doug just calls, which I anticipated him doing with lots of hands, so this doesn't help me narrow down his range too much. He could have a 10, maybe two overs with backdoor draws, maybe small or medium pocket pairs, and there's some small chance that he has jacks or queens, but those are discounted since he didn't 4-bet us preflop, which he'll do at least some percentage of the time, and he didn't check raise us on the flop, which he'll probably do some percentage of the time as well. The turn is the three of clubs, it's a sweet card because no additional hands are beating us that are plausible. If Doug has threes, we might be able to get it all in. If he has fours or fives, we can probably get at least one more additional street of value. Hands like nines and eights won't be afraid of the three either. Doug checks again. We need to start building this pot up a little more. Ideally, we want to set ourselves up to get all the money in on or by the river. I bet 1200. It's slightly less than half the pot. Maybe it's on the small side considering what Doug has and what I just stated is our goal, but it makes it seem as if maybe I'm playing cautiously or afraid of something, and it again provides an opportunity for Doug to check raise us. The smaller we bet, the more hands opponents can check raise us with. Doug's going nowhere for that price. He calls. Now I'm beginning to think that queens and jacks are a lot more likely, given that Doug's made it all the way to the river after I 3-bet preflop, bet on the flop, and bet on the turn. I still wouldn't be too surprised to be up against ace-10 suited, nines, eights, sevens, fives, and fours. The river is the eight of hearts. I'm somewhat worried that we're up against a set of eights. Other than that, it's a great card. I don't have to be concerned that Doug will have 9-7 suited because he would have folded that at some point preflop. Doug checks. I want to target his queens, jacks, and ace-10 hands because he won't be calling a third barrel with many other combos. Over pairs and top pair hands should be able to call a fairly large bet. I consider shoving for around 8,000. I might do that as a bluff with a hand like Miss Clubs, Ace-5, or Ace-4. I just don't want to squander this opportunity to make at least some money and give Doug a chance to get away from something like an overpair, which he's definitely capable of folding if I jam. I announce about a 4,000. A quick 4,000. See, Brad, Doug's face, he's disgusted. He's got a bad feeling in his stomach, but I think he's going to lean on making the call, but what, what is really Brad doing this with? Is he really going to barrel three streets on me with a, a busted big slick, ace, queen, etc.? Queens plus, have you beat? Tens, eights possible sets. So Doug losing to a lot, and if anybody can make a good fold, it's the two seed. We've seen him do it. Vanessa, I mean, I mean Doug, is deep in the tank. He hates the spot that he's in. I'm glad to see him thinking hard about this one because this is the first moment that I 100% know that we've got the best hand. Despite being in a difficult situation, Doug is still cracking jokes. I'd be joining you on the stuck train here. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about boarding trains to Stuckville. Population one currently with McLovin in the nine seat buried 10K.
Doug's travel plans sound amazing, but I'm doing my best to show no emotion. The longer that he contemplates what to do, the more likely it is that he has a top pair hand or an over pair. I know it, and Doug knows that I know it. You know what hand I have. It's your hand. <laughs> the jiggities. <laughs> Makes the call. Shows the set. And Brad Owen. Big pot. We get the call to win a huge pot against one of the main people who inspired me to make poker content on YouTube. Number five this week, and Alex Duval is playing in a 2-5-10 game at the win in Vegas. And there are some big ball, I mean, bets in this hand. On to the final hand of the night. I have ace queen off and raised to $30 in the hijack. The cutoff three bets to $90. This is the same exact opponent that three bet us in the last hand and folded when there was a four bet. The small blind ends up cold calling the $90. The cutoff in this hand has been stacked a couple times, so it's certainly tilting and has been very aggressive. For this reason, along with the dead money from the small blind, I 4-bet to 325. It doesn't take too long for the hijack to 5-bet to $800. The small blind now of course gets out of the way and action is back to us. We certainly do not want to call and play this hand post-flop. We are about $2,000 effective to start this hand. With ace-queen off, it's either fold or 6-bet bluff all in. And if you know anything about me, I don't give up. And if you know me, I trust my reads. I trust my gut. I won't be bitched around at the poker table. I six bet all in for about $2,000. And my opponent immediately folds. Let's go. We are very happy this bluff gets through to end the night and cash out. Number four this week, and Branson is playing at the Gardens in California. He's in a 5-5 cash game. And in this one, we see a little bit of physical play which is, well, weird, right? A guy across the table commented on it, so I told him, you know what, this next hand's for you, and that leads us to the trash hand of queen four of diamonds in the small blind. The action folds to me, and I open to $35. The big blind calls, his name is June, and we're heads up to a flop of 785 with two diamonds. All things considered, this is about the best I can ask for with queen four. I have a flush draw and a gut shot. However, this board shouldn't connect well with my opening range, so I decide to check with the intention of check raising. June bets $60. I'm sticking to the plan, and I raise to $180. June calls, and the turn comes an offsuit ace. I have $485 left in my stack. At this point, I think I have two options. I can bet about half pot, or I can overbet the pot and rip my stack in. This ace should be a lot better for my range than his, so if I actually had a good hand that wanted to be paid off by a single pair type hand, I would probably bet half pot now and jam the river. On the other hand, jamming now would apply maximum pressure, but might look bluffier. I decide on the first option and bet $210. If he calls, I'll jam if I hit the river and give up if I miss. Well, it does not come to that because he goes all in. I guess I just have to call and hope I hit. That is until he starts kicking me in the leg. I'm kicking you on the leg. <laughs> I'm kicking you on the leg. <laughs> I'm kicking you on the I know, I know, I know. Hang on. Make a deal. Right, you know, give me my hundred dollar bill or whatever. Now, June and I had been quite friendly, so him kicking me under the table is him saying, I have you beat. I have a monster. It's 275 more for me to call to win a pot of 1400, meaning I have to win 20% of the time to be profitable. Best case scenario is that all my straight and flush outs are clean and I win 27% of the time. Worst case is that he has a hand like ace x of diamonds that has a pair and a better diamond draw making my chances slim to none. I think it's pretty close. He mentioned making a deal so I bring it back up. Do you want to make a deal or do you want to gamble? Whatever. I already gave you, I already gave you pickings. Do you have a deal that you want? Whatever you want. No, no, no. It, I give you a hundred dollars back. I can afford. 
All right, all right. I'll take the hundred bucks and take the deal. Okay, man. Okay. Can I see it? Can I see it? Yeah, go look at it. Right. Don't see it now. You can kill yourself. <laughs> you son of a gun, June, kicking me with pocket tens. At three, and we're back with Alex Duval. He's in that two-five cash game at the win in Vegas. And this is a great example of how playing your hand blind can go so right, only to suddenly go so wrong. In the next hand, there is an under the gun shadow on for $10. We raise to $30 on the low jack with an unknown hand, and the whale ends up calling on the hijack. The under the gun straddle ends up 3 betting big to 275. My hand is unknown in this one because I folded pre. The whale, however, ends up calling, which is important because he now has an over $4,000 stack. Managing to get lucky versus many victims, which were not us, thankfully. The flop comes 9 9 deuce, 2 diamonds. The under the gun player bets $200 and the whale raises to 450. The under the gun player makes a call and the turn is the queen of spades. With almost $1,500 already in this pot, the under the gun player checks and the whale bets $400. Now the under the gun player min raises to $800. It's back to the whale who eventually goes all in for about $3,500 total. The under the gun player snap calls and the river is the 10 of clubs. The hijack will end up showing pocket queens for a turned boat and the whale shows 9-4 off. I think it's safe to say the whale called blind pre in this hand again. They did flop trips and probably would have doubled up if the queen didn't come on the turn. This was an especially funny hand because on the turn, the whale was talking a lot and actually said this. Need a four. Four is key. <laughs> he wasn't lying, but turns out that would not have helped him anyways. Number two this week, we're back with Branson. He's at the gardens in California in that 5-5 cash game. And you folks are going to have to tell me what exactly is going on on the river in this one. So I pick up six, seven of clubs on the button, the under the gun limps, the hijack raises to $30. I think briefly about three betting, but decide to just call in position to see a flop. The under the gun calls as well were three ways to a flop of eight, four, three with two hearts. The under the gun leads out for $45. The preflop razor folds and it's on us. I think he's most likely leading here with an eight or a draw of some kind. I'm in position, I decide to make the call, and it's a good thing I did because the turn comes a five. We hit our straight, the absolute nuts, and better yet, he bets again, this time for $100. I raise to 275, an eight is still the highest card on the board, so I try to make it a price I think a pair of eights might stick around. I also want action from his draws or on the off chance he has a set. He makes the call and the river comes the five of hearts. Now our opponent decides to go all in and I'm not going to lie. This is probably the single worst river card to come out. All the flush is hit. And if he does somehow have a set, they all became full houses now. I only have $225 left in my stack, so this bet is less than a third of the pot. Even though I feel like I'm beat, I don't think I can fold to this price, but as I'm thinking, he says, it helps, I'll show you one card, the first one. He flips an eight and then says, put a hundred and I'll show you another one. <laughs> if I put a hundred in, you'll show the other one. Now he flips an ace, and uh, yeah, I mean, I call and win the pot. What do you guys think of that deal? Have you ever seen anyone use this move? And do you think there's any appropriate time that this might work? Let me know in the comments. And stealing the number one spot this week is Ashley Sleeth. Unusually for Ashley, playing in a cash game. This one, a 2-5-10 cash game at the win in Vegas. Those of you that watch the channel regularly will know that we usually see Ashley in tournaments. And there's not much to say other than boom, boom, boom.
30 minutes later, I get ace queen suited in the low jack and make it $30 to go. The small blind is one of those guys that I was talking about earlier who are kind of in between pro and recreational. He obviously plays here a lot, but I don't think this is his main source of income. He makes it 125 to go from the small blind. I should say that he had been playing pretty tight up until this point. So that's my only read to go off of those few things. I make the call obviously with ace queen suited in position. It plays really well. Let's see a flop. The dealer puts out king queen jack. <laughs> <laughs> two spades and a club. So a royal flush draw comes on the flop, plus middle pair to go with it, plus a straight draw. I mean, we just absolutely smash this flop. It could almost not get any better of a draw. So when he bets, $75. I have a decision about what I want to do. Do I want to raise here? Do I want to just call and move forward? I think I just have so much of the board that I want to just be calling at this point. And I have a ton of equity. It's going to be so easy to play going forward. So I want to keep in all of his potential bluffs. So I make the call and the turn is the 10 of spades gin card. I make my first royal flush in my entire life playing live. I think even online too. I think this is my very first royal flush and it's in spades it's the best suit wow this is really cool in a three bet pot in a two five game that's playing bigger than normal it's just the dream scenario so small blind actually continues this card i was really shocked to see that he puts out 125 really small bet about a little more than a quarter of the pot you know i think he has a lot of one card straights here with an ace after he three bets pre and continues for a small sizing on this turn. The problem with raising this turn that I thought in game was that it's really tough to balance that. I'm trying to make a decision that makes my opponents make the most mistakes. In other words, I'm trying to make his life the toughest. And I think that if I raise this turn and then, you know, jam river, I'm making his life very easy to let him off the hook and fold his ace, which makes it straight right now. So if that's the case, and I don't really have a lot of bluffs, the, I think the things that come to mind are just an ace of spades king and an ace of spades queen, to be honest. Those are the offsuit combos that I would call that have an ace of spades in them pre-flop to his three bet. It's not too many combos. And I think that if I did have those, they would be so good that I might just call anyway. So it really leaves me with not a lot of things to be raising as a bluff on the turn. And if you don't have a lot of bluffs in a spot, it's probably not a good time to be raising your nutted hands. And it's like, I don't study royal flush draw spots on online. I don't study quad spots very much online. They just don't come up that often. So I feel like a little bit in no man's land, but on the fly, those were my thoughts about the hand, especially because I also have the queen of spades. It's really hard to cooler him. I mean, unless he was three betting me with something like nine eight of spades preflop, he just doesn't have a lot of flushes in this spot. So that was my decision point here. I know I talked a lot about it, but I think it was a major decision points that could go a couple of different ways and this was just what I landed on. The river is the six of diamonds, a complete brick, and he doesn't slow down. He bets $200, again, quite a tiny bet. There's $665 in the middle. He only bet less than a third of the pot. I have $1,000 behind on this river. No matter what, I'm raising. I have a royal freaking flush. But what size do I go? You know, it's really hard for him to have a flush. I have the ace and the queen of spades. So I don't think I'm getting called by those hands. So I have to assume that the only thing I'm getting called by when I raise is the naked ace. And if he's calling just to chop the pot and I go all in for a thousand, I think I'm just gonna get him to fold way too much. And I'm gonna, like I said, make his life really easy. So I landed on a slightly smaller than all in size, which was 650. I thought that it was big enough that it could be a bluff and that it was small enough that I didn't put so much pressure on him that he folds because he's only calling to win half the pot in his mind. But you guys, maybe I should have just go, gone all in because he <laughs> snap puts in the chip before he could even finish saying 650. He snap put in the call. I show my royal flush and he's like, oh, is that all? Royal. Yeah, royal. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, royal flush. <laughs> in spades. In spades. This is it. Floor. Full floor. Yeah, I get paid off on my first Royal Flush ever live. Really, really fun. Highly recommend it.
That's right, folks. A royal flush. Certainly not a hand that you see every week. Not a hand that you see over 25 years of playing poker if you're me, but that's another story entirely. Congratulations, Ashley. Hitting the royal flush of spades of all suits right there on the turn. Congratulations to you. Well, that's it, folks. Another episode from Suited Aces of 10 of the Best. We hope you've enjoyed it. As always, please do hit the like and subscribe button. We know that you know that it helps us out a whole bunch, so we really appreciate it when you click those buttons. Any feedback, we love to hear it. We try and reply. Just jot them down in the comments box below and we'll get back to you. Until next week then, folks, the very best of luck at the felt.